Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to today's live conversation with Push Black and also with Sada Abdulaziz from the Abolitionist Teaching Network. Today, we're actually going to cover the infamous Atlanta public school cheating scandal that scapegoated black employees for problems rooted in the educational reform movement. So for folks who may be unfamiliar, in March of 2013, 35 educators in the Atlanta public school system were charged with racketeering and conspiracy. All right. These are the same two charges that are used to bring down the American mafia, but this was used to target teachers for allegedly changing students' answers on standardized tests. Now, 12 educators were brought to trial, and they were all black. Ten were found guilty, and seven are still in limbo as they hope for appeals and fear the very real danger of imprisonment. So this evening, we're going to speak with Saad Abdelaziz of the Abolitionist Teaching Network about the ongoing campaign to free the APS-7. And a bit about Sada. So Sada is the current director of the Activist and Residence Program at the Abolitionist Teaching Network. They are a former educator as well as an organizer and activist who's worked in fostering and supporting communities um, for 10 years now. So Sada is also from the global and national U.S. South, and they find inspiration in meeting and fighting alongside the communities they find themselves in. Queer people of color who are rowdy because they know they deserve more. And it's this realization of the abolition freedom dream that keeps them connected and accountable to all of our collective liberation. So once again, thank you so much for joining us, Sada. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yes, yes. Just to begin today's conversation, we wanted to know if you could share a little bit about your own personal journey into abolition as a practice and philosophy. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Um, man, I feel like answering questions like that requires you to go back to some of the first moments where you recognize how messed up the world is and your place. Yeah. But I don't think we have time for all that. So. Um, really my exposure to thinking of abolition as a practice was around um, and the Arab Spring was popping off then. Uh, so a bunch of revol revolutions happening across the Middle East, North Africa, and one happened in Egypt. Um, and I've been kind of politically engaged as a young person, but I felt like my imagination was limited by what we're usually exposed to. Like, the Democratic Party or a nonprofit that uses liberal means to get certain ends. Yes. And so that moment, oh shit, people can revolt. I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. People can, okay, uh, people can revolt and people can abolish the conditions that they're in and they can demand something larger than our sort of political system allows us to imagine. And that was the beginning. And it's developed, it's developed into police abolition. I worked as a police abolitionist for years and years in Atlanta. Um, and then when ATN was created in 2020, it was also when sort of like all of the cities in the United States were on fire around George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. So it was a continuation of abolition and that practice. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing a bit about that journey. And you mentioned ATN. Um, I wanted to kind of familiarize our audience with the wonderful work at the Abolitionist Teaching Network. And I want to know if you could just share a little bit about its current initiatives, its mission, and specifically the activist in residence program that you all offer. Yeah. So ATN, Abolitionist Teaching Network, sorry, I will try and not say ATN every time, but I will probably say it a lot. Um, ATN was created in 2020, and it was sort of a response by a few educators to this book that one of the founders, Tina Love, wrote, We Want to Do More Than Survive. She was reading the book. It was taken off. Uh, the goal was to kind of speak to K through 12 public educators. And she was going around the country, and educators were like, yes, this speaks to me so much. Absolutely. What can I do? And Tina's response was organized. And people were like, what? Um, I think people already were engaged in organizing and some people didn't really know exactly what that meant. And so ATN was born as sort of a living response to that alongside a couple other founders, one of whom is an elementary school teacher. Um, and so our goal, our mission is to bring this idea of abolition squarely into the public education 
system. Um, people have tried to reform the US public education system for a long time. It's not gotten us very far. There's a lot of really traumatizing and terrible things that have happened to people through the veneer of reform in the United States and particularly black, brown and working class people. And so just like the idea of abolition asks us to look at the nexus, the root of all of these things, we're asking for the same thing in terms of education. So people might be familiar with that, with like the school to prison pipeline or nexus, which is an aspect of it, but really it's also begging us to reimagine all of it for our needs, for what we deserve, for what we want for ourselves as black and brown and marginalized. So the initiatives we have, um, we have that activist in residence program, I'll get into that last. Uh, we have something called the Virtual Freedom School, which is a freedom school offered to young people to kind of learn the things that we don't typically learn in K through 12 schooling, like we learn a lot of Shakur, we learn some freedom songs, we learn what it means to be self-determined, what it means to be a white comrade or co-conspirator as a young person, all of that. We have our programming that we offer online, mostly for K, for K through 12 public education teachers. So some of that is like spaces for folks to heal, some of that is programming specifically around the things 12 educators ask us for programming around. Um, we have our grants. We give out tens of thousands of dollars every year at the end of the year people who are fighting all over. Some of that is like single moms who are surviving mm -hmm. best for their kids. Some of that are incar incarcerated people who are doing education inside. Uh, so we gave out around $90,000 just a few months ago. Um, we have more things, but I'm going to go to active, the Activist in Residence program. And the Activist in Residence program, the idea behind it is so many teachers, so many students are fighting for the things that they need in their schools, at their schools, communities, but oftentimes it's either unpaid labor or it's labor on top of a lot of other labor. And so the idea behind the Activist in Residence program is why don't we find some of the organizers or the activists and the cities where they are and fund them to do the work that they probably are doing for free anyway, yeah. and also allow them to take a step back and to really strategize and think big picture rather than the cycle there's an act get caught up in is like response, 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 reactivity. What that back thinking in a broader and larger picture about how to really, really affect change and education in your city. So we have that right now in four um, Atlanta, Cincinnati, Milwaukee, and the greater Boston area. Wow. No, this is amazing to hear. Um, audience, I hope you get tapped in. This is amazing what you all are offering and what you all are doing and how you're supporting in so many different facets. And right now, I want to kind of segue into our uh, centered topic for this evening, which is the Atlanta public school scandal, um, just to kind of open us up. If you could, Sada, tell us how you personally became involved in the APS scandal. And if you could share with us just a brief update on where the free APS campaign, APS 7 campaign stands today. Sure. Um, and just think that if you've been in Atlanta for a while, if you're from the city or the surrounding area, I grew up in Metro Atlanta, I've been in the city for most of my adult life, you know about the APS cheating scandal. Um, you might know about it, especially I think if you're of a certain age. You might know about it, and what usually happens is people, when you bring it up today, they're like, yeah, that happened a few years ago. You know, whatever feelings they have about it, but it's over. Yeah. Um, actually, I had a roommate a few years ago who ended up co-writing a book with one of the teachers that was caught up in the APS cheating scandal. So that's None of the Above, which is by Shawnee Robinson and Anna Simonton. And so I sort of like knew it was happening. And then late last year, some of the, um, a couple of the teachers approached us alongside Anna saying, hey, it seems like this is right up y'all's alley. Wow. Seven of them still caught up in this. One of them has sort of an eminent appeal that we think might be rejected, that her lawyer thinks might be rejected by the Georgia Supreme Court. So these people could go to prison any day now. Could y'all as ATN please help us? 
Uh, so we started late last year with kind of building back up a bit of an awareness around it because people think that this is something that's in the past. Yeah. We'll get into more of the details, but the general update is, um, so there's seven people left. One of them is represented by one lawyer. The six are represented by another lawyer. So the one, that's Dana Evans, she's kind of fast-tracked. She's a former principal um, at Dobbs Elementary. Mm -hmm. And her, that what her case has sort of revealed is that very likely that the judge in this case, Judge Jerry Baxter, who is now a retired judge, but who still gets to decide what happens to her and these other six people, that he seems pretty intent on sending them in. Um, it seems like the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, who's the Fulton County District Attorney and who was the lead prosecutor of the APS cheating scandal, which is a pretty big deal, um, he seems to support continuing to charge them and put them in prison. And so mm -hmm. basically kind of fighting this fight to not allow that to happen, to do whatever we can so that these people don't go to prison and so that we can also change the narrative. For us, yeah. seven people got blamed for standardized testings faults. And so let's actually point out the real culprit here, which is standardized testing. Yes, yes. Um, thank you so much for speaking to the, um, well, really the racialized dimensions of this as well. Um, through research, I learned myself that though n numerous instances of cheating were reported across at least 40 states in the U.S. at the time this story broke, including like counties in northern Georgia, right, um, it seems that only 12 black Atlanta educators were actually targeted for prosecution. I'm just curious, um, how does the abolitionist teaching network make sense of that kind of discrepancy? It's just anti-blackness. I mean, <laughs> have to call a spade a spade. Um, yeah, there was around 200 schools that were investigated across Georgia. It started off with the AJC pointing out, hey, scores from one year to another in these schools are really high it seems statistically improbable. So they start, they write a few articles. It spurs an investigation by the state of Georgia around 2011. And 200 schools are investigated. About a quarter of those are APS schools, but the rest are all over Georgia. At that point in time, Georgia schools are populated by 60% white teachers. So the majority of teachers in Georgia are white. And somehow we end up with 12 black Atlanta educators on trial. The fascinating thing about this too is like people had admitted guilt uh, during the investigation by the GBI. They had said like, yes, I participated. Those people didn't actually go to trial. So the people who end up, uh, one of them goes to trial. She's actually absolved. 11 other people who have been proclaiming their innocence the whole time, they're the ones that end up being found guilty. Wow. Um, the 35, it kind of start, it went from like around 200 and then it went to 35. Of those 35, before it siphoned off to the 12, all of them were people of color, 34 of them were black. So I think mm. the writings on the wall, um, there's really no other explanation other than the fact that it's anti-blackness. And I think also specifically this desire to carve up Atlanta like the APS cheating scandal gave legitimacy to the idea of state takeover of schools. It gave mm. legitimacy to the idea of, of Atlanta schools being failures and needing to be privatized or made into charter schools and all of that kind of the general gentrification that's been happening in the city for decades now. Oh, wow. That was literally my next question. If you could speak to the shifting demographics that have been happening in Atlanta and how that has shaped the uh, sensationalizing of this case in the local media. Yeah, I mean, the local media's coverage is a whole nother thing. I think it's really important to point out that there was a gag order on the people in the trial, so they could wow. not actually speak to the media. So really, one narrative came out. Um, and I'm sorry to say it, but the AJC, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, would be incredibly reactionary. <laughs> and their coverage of this was no exception. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I, I think also just one last thing on that media piece, and I'll answer your question more thoroughly, is a lot of people today are like, okay, well, the gag order isn't in place anymore. Why aren't these teachers speaking out? Very few of them are. Uh, one of them is super outspoken, Sean Robinson. And I think it's really important to think about the fact that these people's, their entire fate and destiny is in the hands of public officials who have brought up what they said in the media against them um, mm. after they closed. And so I guess if you put yourself in that position, would you feel like free and open to sort of speak to the media or would you be really moving in fear a lot of the time? Um, yeah. So that's, but, oh man, I feel like I just talked so long that I kind of forgot what you asked me. No, 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 <laughs> you, you're, you're killing it. No, I was curious about the, because um, you spoke about the, um, the aspect of gentrification and I'm really curious about the shifting demographics in Atlanta and how that kind of influenced the perception of this case. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I think there's so many ways to go into answering that. Um, one of the things that sort of sticks out to me when I'm thinking about the shifting demographics is the a, a couple years after the case is closed. So the case is the longest criminal trial um, and most expensive criminal trial in Georgia history, which is pretty wild. It ends in 2015. Um, and shortly thereafter, there's a ballot initiative uh, called the Opportunity School District. Mm -hmm. And it's this really vaguely, wildly worded ballot initiative that basically allows for the state of Georgia to take over certain schools that they deem as failing. When you look at that, when you looked at it at the time, those schools, a lot of them mapped kind of perfectly onto the same schools that were caught up in the APS cheating scandal. A lot of them perfect mapped onto schools in Atlanta that were in areas that were sort of becoming more desirable and more white and more affluent. Mm. Um, Southeast Atlanta um, or near downtown or the West side. And so I think that like, yeah, the changing demographics allow a couple of things to happen. One, again, is this narrative of like failing schools and basically like schools beginning to succeed as the city becomes more white and more affluent. Um, mm -hmm. Like we should have a conversation about the resources that weren't given to the schools when they were more working class and black. Um, and then simultaneously, I think it allows people to put it in another time and place in their kind of imagination of Atlanta. Like yeah. reason to me why a lot of people think that the APS cheating scandal is over. And that's because it unfolded in a somewhat different Atlanta than exists today. Wow. So you can get a bit of distance from it as well. Luckily that ballot initiative was knocked down, but a lot of a lot of these schools, I mean like a lot of these schools are constantly at risk of being shut down. A couple mm -hmm. of them have shut down. So, yeah, as the residents of areas are moving more white residents, it's just to take over privatization carterization that I wanted to do. Wow. Thank you for giving clarity to that. And to that point, you mentioned how this case is the most expensive and the longest running criminal prosecution case in Georgia history, which is really absurd. Um, and I really can't get over that, how violently absurd just the use of the RICO charge was here as well. And to that point, um, I'm curious if you can share with us how certain elected officials, you've already mentioned them, such as DA Fonnie Willis, um, how some have used this case to kind of bolster their careers. I'm even thinking of uh, former Governor Sonny Perdue, right? Um, it seems like some folks have actually exploited this case to their gain. Yes, yes. Uh, it's super sad and it's pretty commonplace. So one of them mm -hmm. is A. Fonny Willis, who in part really made her career off the prosecution of that case. Wow. I, the framing of the case because there was a gag order because there was just sort of like a media buy-in of the state narrative rather than investigating standardized testing or choosing to sort of question any of the other culprits in it. Um, because of that, DA Fonnie Willis felt like a hero for Atlanta's children. 
like she was doing this for Atlanta's children. And that's sort of always been with Judge Jerry Baxter, that's also been his narrative. We're doing this, y'all wronged Atlanta's children and we're doing this to sort of like for vengeance for Atlanta's children. Mm. Um, so she in part made her career off of this. She's now the DA. And the interesting thing too, is she was sort of the right hand of then district attorney, Paul Howard, who is her predecessor. Uh, who she beat uh, a couple years ago to become DA. And Paul Howard also, I mean, really all of this is genuinely basically Paul's fault, but wow. Paul Howard running for reelection. Um, he made, because he was looking like in a worse off place and he knew that Fonny was a real contender and a real competitor. He made a deal with the teachers and he was like, I'm going to come, I'm going to come out publicly in support of sentence modifications in support of y'all not going to prison. Um, if like this politician will endorse me, this sort of progressive politician. Will endorse me. So, so yeah, it's sort of a twisted thing because if DA Howard had won, even though his legacy is also marred with stuff, he was basically using these people's lives to like, hopefully get reelected. Um, so the, the DA, I think in terms of uh, thinking about other elected officials, the two governors who sort of preside over this period of time and Georgia's history, which are Nathan Deal and Sonny Perdue, they both make money off of this. Uh, so, like the, mm. uh, so No Child Left Behind happens in 2001, right, under George W. Bush. Obama has something called Race to the Top um, that he rolls out, I think, in his first term. And Race to the Top offers, it's basically rewarding high standardized tests. And it's also uh, creating a pretty sustainable pathway for privatization and charterization of schools, of public schools. Georgia is awarded $400 million from Race to the Top with the same exact test scores that land teachers in jail. And they're like prosecuting these teachers while also getting hundreds of millions of dollars, which they then used to sort of, again, continue the privatization of schools. So like, tell me how it's double speak, you know, like, tell me how you're so upset on behalf of Atlanta's children and Georgia's children. And then you're taking these same exact test scores that you have admitted are inflated in some way and that people should go to prison for to get money. So the web of elected officials kind of profiting off of this is pretty, pretty wide. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for laying that out. Four hundred million dollars they received off these test scores they claim were allegedly falsified. OK, wow. You know, I want to transition and talk a little bit more specifically about the intersections between education policy and uh, increased carceralization, which we're seeing explicitly in this case. But I'm curious, Sada, if you could speak to how high stakes testing, or rather the standardized testing industry, how does that contribute to the school to prison nexus or pipeline? This is like, you know, the topic of all books, but I'll try and do it slight justice. Um, Standardized testing has basically completely in a matter of like just a couple decades, really since 2001 or so around No Child Left Behind has managed to place itself as the single arbiter of a student's success of like whether a student is doing well and then zoom out whether or not a teacher is doing well in their classroom and then zoom mm -hmm. out not a school is doing well in its district a district is doing well in its state and so on. These standard tests through numerous studies um, have been shown to be classist and racist, have been for the most part better at showing you a student's zip code than a student's intelligence. So we already have that sort of embedded, baked into the pie of standardized tests. And then we see the reason why it's called high stick, stakes standardized testing is because it is so high stakes for some mm -hmm. of these tests. Your failure of it means that you don't move on to the next grade. It ha many, many studies have shown that when students are held back, they're much more likely to end up 
incarcerated. They're much more likely to end up with lower job opportunities. They're much less likely to continue on to higher education, to be eligible for scholarships, so on and so forth. And if we really, if we just understand the studies for what they are, showing that their classes break this, we understand how high stakes they are and how they actually end up like there's a straight line basically between a student failing a test and a student being more likely to go to prison, then we see how this feeds is a furnace for the student to prison pipeline or nexus, really. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, we can see that so clearly with students. And then this case allows us to see it with teachers too. But basically, everyone ends up criminalized and with a worse education too. Teachers increasingly only teach to the test, which means they can't teach whole ass subjects like social studies, history, or art, sometimes science. <laughs> All things admit are so yeah. Wow. Wow. Thank you for speaking to the um just the impact this has on the actual like education that students receive. And to that point, you mentioned earlier how Georgia and Atlanta public officials often claim this scandal was like a grave injustice to the youth of Atlanta. Um, but I'm curious, just in your time with the Abolitionist Teaching Network, as well as your time in Atlanta, um, how have the actual students impacted by this ordeal responded? Um, have they given voice to what it is they wish to see? Or I'm just curious, how do they understand or yeah. engage this issue? I think that's a great question. I won't claim to know what every single student who was affected thinks. What I do know is that there have been many, many students that have come out publicly against all of this, that have come out in favor of the teachers caught up in this. For instance, one of the co-authors of None of the Above, which is sort of the definitive book on the scandal, her guidance counselor was Dana Evans, and she was moved to... Uh -huh. She was like, that was such an incredible guidance counselor. She helped me. She changed many students' lives. How did this happen to her? Um, the week that Dana Evans was supposed to have her final hearing on February 14th, they pushed it back. She doesn't have a date yet. But that same week, another one of her students wrote an op-ed in the AJC coming out against this. There have been several of their students that have come out in support, come out to rallies, tried to organize petitions, tried to figure out any way that they can support them. So I think I've heard in my time in Atlanta and through more seriously sort of working on this, many, many students not buying the narrative that they're being sold. And then I mm -hmm. think to the, the like, the sort of, um, if you want to call them reparations, which they're absolutely not, but sort of the things that are get, have been given to the students of Atlanta to make up for what happened have been sad and sorry. Like there was some target program that um, that was supposed to help the students that were affected by the scandal, provide them with after, uh, after schooling and like tutoring and all of this. And that program was shown to be ineffective. And that is, again, we're talking about the most expensive criminal trial in Georgia history. The resources were there if it was about the students, why weren't the resources put where the students are to actually give them scholarships to help them engage in schooling in a way that's beneficial to them. Instead, it was used to create this sort of sham trial. Mm, wow, wow. You know, I'm thinking a bit specifically about the, um, the APS7 who are fearing imprisonment right now and just how long this case has been. I can't imagine the emotional and mental turmoil that they've had to experience. Um, maybe for folks that's joining us, and again, for folks who are unfamiliar with this case and how long it's lasted, I'm curious, Sada, if you could just share a bit about some of the hardships experienced by these teachers targeted in this case over the decade since it broke. Yeah. Um, you know, some of these teachers have been diagnosed with PTSD. Mm. Some of them have lost their homes. Um, basically also they're in professional ruin too, right? Uh, their names were blasted all over. Um, a couple of them have attributed this to their kind of relationships or marriages falling apart because of the amount oh, wow. of stress. Um, one of them, Johnny, she was pregnant for the entirety of the trial. This 
longest trial in criminal history. She was pregnant with her child who luckily was born healthy and is beautiful and wonderful. But imagine the sort of stress that she was enduring thinking about whether she was going to be able to be with her child, whether she was going to have to go to prison pregnant, what, and she had to spend a few nights in jail pregnant, right? Wow. So on, on, I think all of these people, what I've heard repeatedly is they've just been caught in a limbo. They've basically been on an appeal bond for seven years. Mm. And the stress of the trial itself was very intense. The stress of the investigation before that was very intense. But then imagine having for seven years and continuing because we don't have clarity on final hearing dates this hanging over your head, like, oh, any day now, any day now, are people gonna, you know, people were stressing when they thought that the final hearing date was going to happen in February about like, if I go to work, are the cops just going to show up there and arrest me in front of my coworkers? Are they going to do it in front of my children? Or So it's, it's very intense. Wow. Wow. Thank you for sharing. Okay. I'm curious, uh, what are some ways our audience can get engaged and advocate for the APS7? How can they support? Are there any resources we should look to to get familiar with the case? So please um, follow our social media. We post a lot about what you can do, ATN underscore 1863, um, and go onto our website. Basically what we're doing is a public pressure campaign on some of these powerful people that have the ability to change the outcome of this. So we're doing phone zaps every single week. This week, it's for the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, that I talked about. It, the script is already written for you. The number is already there. You'll probably get sent to voicemail. It'll take you two to five minutes maximum. And we're just asking that you tell her whether you live here, fantastic, or you don't, fantastic, that you don't approve of this and you want her to modify the sentence. Last week, it was John Asa. The week before that, the a public school superintendent. So we're going after these people who, because the judge in this case, Judge Jerry Baxter, is a retired judge, a retired white judge who gets to decide the fate of these people and has no public office. Like we can't put him out, can't call his office, we can't send letters, right? We kind of have to go through these proxies as well. But it's important that they come out. If you know a city council person or someone with some sway who, if they came out against this, celebrity for God's like anyone who if they came out against this it would make a wave then that would be incredibly powerful we have a petition on our website that you can sign in 20 seconds um, and we are also offering things like teach-ins if you're a teacher on the college level or k-12 through level and you need a rest for a day and your students to learn really important piece of history some of our activists and residents can zoom or come in and do a talk. Um, and then we're also trying to zoom out and change the narrative of who's the culprit, which I mentioned before is standardized. It's not these 11 black educators. And so as part of that, we've started an opt out campaign. People who are on the West Coast like you or in New York might be familiar with opting out. That's a choice that caregivers, parents can make to remove their children from standardized testing. It's a right that some caregivers have that they don't know about because you're basically sort of bullied into the testing system. And so we've listed out a bunch of resources on our website for how parents can opt their children out of upcoming tests. Even if it's just that your child is really anxious and you don't expose them to that same don't don't expose them to that so it's also engaging in that and increasingly calling into legitimacy standardized testing helps these teachers by showing that we don't buy into the fact that standardized testing is what is good for the students in u.s public education we want real educators who care about them these seven are some of those educators we don't want them to be caught up in this school to prison nexus so opting out as well is a choice that people can make wow okay thank you so much for laying that out for us um 
Yes, before we wrap up today, just out of any last kind of comments or anything you want to leave the audience with, you just gave us a plethora of ways to get engaged. Um, but just any final thoughts before we wrap up our convo this evening? No, oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate what Push Black does and the light that y'all have shown on this. So thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And for our audience, you know, through our discussion this evening, we really see how high stakes testing and turns many black classrooms and schools into test prep centers, right? Rather than offering a culturally rich and engaging, well-rounded educational experience. We learned about No Child Left Behind and how this raised the stakes attached to test results, especially in urban low-income districts, which face severe penalties for failing to boost these test scores. And this provides a pretext for removing low scoring students and improving the school's test score as a bottom line. And since No Child Left Behind, there's been an increased use of strategies such as withdrawing students from schools, sending them to alternative schools or GED programs. For Florida, an example, a study cited by fairtest.org found schools gave low scoring students longer suspensions than high scoring students who committed similar infractions. Simply put, the punitive culture of standardized testing it really promotes strategies to weed out the low scores. And knowing this, right, we can begin to understand how racist policies such as No Child Left Behind and the entire standardized testing industry really targets and penalizes not only black students, but through the APS scandal we see, it criminalizes black educators and undermines the integrity of black communities. So with this said, we invite you all to join Push Black and the Abolitionist Teaching Network in the larger fight to reclaim education and to protect our educators. So thank you again, Sada, for joining us. I'm Darren Wallace with Push Black and Free the APS 7. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We'll see you next week. Thank you.